Christ is risen. risen Alleluia. I am Pastor Nanette Christofferson, and along with Pastor Steve Talmadge, we welcome you to our in-person and our online 9 o'clock contemporary worship service. We have a few announcements for you this morning. The first one begins with, wow, our word on Wednesday has resumed, and we offer a children's musical time for kids. We also offer a youth time, and we also have a Bible study called The Greatest Story. That is a self-contained Bible study, so you can come anytime from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening. If you'd like to come for dinner at 5.30, come at 5.30. But we'd like to make sure everyone knows that and is welcome to it. We have um, an ELCA candidate and our youth director, Kevin Anderson, giving our message this morning. And we also um, need some clothing for iHelp. iHelp is a program that we work with with Lutheran Social Services of, of um, hosting homeless women or women who are experiencing homelessness. And they need some lighter summer clothing and shoes. So if um, you have some to donate, we have an iHelp basket in the, in the narthex here. But also uh, you can drop them off at the office too as these clothes will be used. We have a short video this morning. It has now been 35 years since ELCA um, started. I was trying to think in 1988 where I was in college then, and I don't think I had really thought much about the Lutheran Church <laughs> or the ELCA. So I think this is a, a time to remember uh, the goodness of how this church uh, was combined and started. So we have uh, a former Bishop Lowell Allman on video this morning who's going to tell us about the 35th anniversary of the ELCA. In the history of Lutherans in North America, April 30th is a special day. On April 30th, 1987, the American Lutheran Church, the Lutheran Church in America, and the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches united to form the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I was in the room when that happened. Two days later, I was elected the first secretary of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. In my responsibilities as secretary, I had, so to speak, a front row seat observing the life and work of the ELCA. The ELCA was formed to be a welcome place for everybody, a place announcing healing and hope, 
The ELC was formed to be an instrument of mission for its congregations and 65 synods, an instrument of mission throughout this land and around the world. The ELC was formed to be an agent seeking greater unity, greater Lutheran unity through participation with 150 other churches in the communion of churches known as the Lutheran World Federation greater unity and common mission with other churches in the United States, and greater unity through ecumenical dialogue and conversations, including the ecumenical dialogue that led to the development of the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. That agreement between the Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church was signed in Augsburg, Germany on October 31, 1999. As Pope John Paul II said to me in a meeting anticipating the signing of that joint declaration, our churches together must witness to the promise of salvation through God's unmerited grace. You and I are the recipients of the dreams of Lutherans throughout the decades and centuries. Because of their prayers and work, we have the privilege of celebrating on April 30th the 35th birthday of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Good morning. Please rise as we sing our opening song. We have good news today because there is joy in the house of the Lord. We worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. Well, he opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. Our God, he holds the victory, yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we got be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise Oh, oh, oh We shout out your praise Praise the Lord this morning We sing to a God who heals We sing to a God who cares We sing to a God who always makes a way upon the cross and he rose up from the grave my God still rolling stones away there's joy in the house of the Lord there's joy in the house of the Lord today and we won't be quiet we shout out our praise there's joy in the house of the Lord our God is surely in this place and we won't be quiet we shout out our praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We are the prisoners, now we're running free. We were forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out our praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Let us pray. Lord God, we shout out your praise as we have come here in this place to worship you this day. Lord, as we read in scripture this morning about doubt, 
Doubt is often a source and a part of our faith, for doubt grows us. So Lord, as we get ready to enter into the space and time of worshiping you in the here and now, might we put our fears away, put our doubt away, and focus on you through word, through music, and through your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stay standing as we stand for the gospel acclamation and the reading of God's word. Alleluia, Lord and Savior, open now your saving word. Let it burn like fire within us speak until our hearts are stirred alleluia lord we sing for the good news that you bring alleluia lord we sing for the good news that you bring the gospel The gospel today is from John 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. resurrected one who changes everything, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Up to now, we have journeyed through, with Jesus through Lent into the Last Supper at Monday, Thursday, to the cross of Good Friday, and to our continued surprise, his resurrection on Easter. Just a few verses before our gospel in John This morning, Mary Magdalene and the other disciples find strips of linen and the cloth that Jesus wore in an empty tomb. They are under the impression that Jesus' body has been taken. The disciples leave and Mary is at the tomb crying when she peers into the tomb and sees two angels. She tells them that someone has taken her Lord away. She turns around and sees what she believes is a gardener. And the gardener asks why she is crying, and Mary explains. Eventually, the gardener says her name. And Mary realizes the gardener is actually 
Jesus. Jesus says he is not yet, not yet ascended to the Father, and he tells Mary to tell the disciples that he is alive and he is going to ascend to the Father. Mary follows his command, and then we find the disciples in our gospel reading this morning, hiding in fear when Jesus returns to them. This morning we heard that Thomas needs more than a few words from his friends to know that Jesus is alive. Thomas needs proof. He needs to see the nail marks and put his hand in Jesus' side in order for him to believe. Now you may have heard this story preached on before, and I know that sometimes Thomas is held up as a model of what not to do as a follower of Christ, to doubt. But when I read this story, I can sympathize with Thomas. I think Thomas and the disciples are still grieving. They're still picking up the pieces after Jesus' traumatic death just a few days prior. I can imagine that when Thomas hears the news that Jesus is alive from the other disciples, there is a tiresome tone in his response. As he is still working through the reality that the one whom he trusted and loved is gone. To my surprise, when Jesus and Thomas finally see one another a week later, Jesus indulges Thomas's demands for proof and allows him to see and feel the nail marks and put his hand in his side. Jesus then immediately tells Thomas to stop doubting and believe. This response from Jesus causes me to ponder a question. A question that, for many, the answer may seem obvious. And the question is, what does Jesus mean by believe? Is he simply asking for a cognitive, rational acceptance of him, like some sort of A plus B equals C equation? Is the belief that Jesus is asking from Thomas, like my belief, that when I flip the light switch, the light will turn on? Is Jesus asking Thomas to simply believe that he, Thomas, is going to heaven, and he consequently should be a morally good person? Is Jesus asking for a kind of blind faith belief that does not question or wonder? Or is it a belief centered in constant analytical evaluation? To help us 21st century folks better address this belief question, I think it is helpful for us to look at how belief has worked and been understood since the time of the Reformation. Charles Taylor, a Canadian Catholic philosopher wrote a large 700-page book published in 2007. It is titled A Secular Age. In this book, he looks closely at the historical and philosophical realities that have paved the way for the Western world to be what it is today. Taylor describes that the life of faith around the time of the Reformation operated in transcendence. For example, one of the problems the church had during this time centered around communion, specifically folks not taking communion. When they would receive the bread from their pastor or priest, they would not swallow it. Rather, when the bread was placed in their mouth, they would hold on to it. Some, when they would return to their seat, might put that bread in their pocket and take it home. Once home, they would bury it with the seeds they planted for the season or give it to a sick animal in hopes that the magical bread that they had been given might somehow improve the crop for the season or improve the health of the animal. You see, for many folks in the 16th century, there was a lot of time spent worrying about things like demon possession 
And that is because they believe the spiritual and the physical world were one. It was virtually impossible during this time in the Western world to not believe in God. Eventually, ideas centered around the human ability to use reason and science stemming from humanism and the Enlightenment would become mainstream. And these ideas pull apart that transcendent world where the physical and the spiritual world are one. No longer would it be virtually impossible to not believe in God. And the result was that fewer and fewer people were willing to be a part of religious institutions. As these ideas have continued to grow and develop and take hold in our culture and institutions, we find ourselves today in what Charles Taylor calls an imminent frame. It is the cultural idea that all things can be explained with reason and science. Taylor explains that in the imminent frame, people who claim to believe, who have faith, will find themselves naturally doubting. And people who claim, sorry, people of faith will find themselves questioning whether an experience they had was really God or was just an experience they had because of cells firing in their brain. On the other hand, folks who claim to not believe in anything may find themselves doubting their unbelief as well. And it may come when they hold a child for the first time or when they are unexpectedly reminded of a loved one in the time of grief. One of the most striking occurrences in the imminent frame is the idea that there is a distinguishment, a separation between faith, belief, and action. In our culture, this idea shows itself when parents say that they are much less likely to care about what their children believe, but they care very deeply about how they act or what they do. If we think back only roughly 500 years ago, where churchgoers were planting seeds with communion bread they received, it would be virtually impossible for them to conceive of a world where action and belief were separated. As a result of living in the imminent frame, there are many folks who believe that being an authentic and good person is the highest form of good. And it doesn't matter what source those ideas come from. It could be church, it could be schools, cartoon, sports, band, etc. As long as those ideas, authenticity and being good, are protected and encouraged. Seeing how much our thinking and understanding a belief, is shaped by the time and space we find ourselves. And I venture back to my original question for us today. What does Jesus mean by belief? Is our belief in Jesus separated from our actions? Do we take the time to ponder the belief that Jesus is calling us to? Does our belief in Jesus mean we simply hope to be good people by the standards of our culture who go to heaven one day? Or does our belief in Jesus center us daily in the reality that we are beloved children of God who are sinners saved by grace? Does our belief match our action in our baptismal covenant made with God where we live amongst God's faithful people, where we come and hear the word of God and we share in the Lord's Supper together, where we proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, 
where we serve all people following the example of Jesus and where we strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Amen. Church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. I will call upon your name. My soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. You may be seated. We join our hearts together in prayer for the world, the church, and all who are in need. Gracious God, in this season of Easter, we are filled with gratitude. Our hearts are overwhelmed with thanksgiving that you are a God of hope. You are a God of love. You are a God of forgiveness. You're a God of acceptance. We pray for your church, the body of Christ, scattered around the globe, that we can be faithful to the witness of who you are and whose we are. We give you thanks for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and for those who are a part of the predecessor church bodies who decided that we need to live into your prayer request in John 17, where you prayed that all might be one. We give you thanks for the work of those who brought together this church body so that we could have a witness that shows Christians of the Lutheran tradition working together in mission, in love, in service. We give you thanks that you've guided us over the years to work in partnership agreements with the Episcopalians, the Methodists, the Disciples of Christ, the Reformed Church, the Moravian Church, Because, Lord, we recognize more and more that we share more in common than we don't. And we give you thanks, O Lord, that uh, you've been healing the breach, the distance that has separated us from our brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church. Gracious God, work through bishops and pastors and Sunday school teachers and catechists and council members and all who seek to be faithful in their baptismal vocation. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we are mindful. We are mindful as fires ravage part of this state and other parts of the country that once again we are living in challenging times when it comes to the environment. We pray for those who are uh, fighting on the front lines of those wildfires, for the families that have been evacuated, for those who've lost property. We pray for wisdom in how we manage the land that you have called us to care for. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we pray for your peace to be known, particularly in Ukraine, also in Ethiopia and Eritrea. We know, Lord, that uh, where this battle is going on between Ukraine and Russia, it is part of the breadbasket of Europe. Farmers can't get into the fields to plant And that means there won't be harvests in the fall where many around this world depend on the grains that grow. Lord, we pray that you'll break through, you'll intercede, you'll work through those who are making the decisions to end the violence. Lord, in your mercy. 
And gracious God, we pray for those who are struggling. As inflation hits the pocketbook in very real ways, we know it's the poorest that suffer the most. We pray for those who are unhoused. We pray for those who struggle to find health care, particularly mental health care. We pray for those who are lonely, who are grieving. Lord, in your mercy, we bring before you those on our hearts and minds. We lift before you some who are on our prayer list from this congregation. We remember those who are awaiting surgery, Nancy, Doug, Connie, Jack. For those hospitalized, Lucas and Jared. For those recovering from surgery, Dennis, Ann, Sharon, Sally, Kevin, Kurt. We pray for those who are grieving, particularly for Sue Kilgore family and friends upon the death of Sue's son, Scott. May the hope of the resurrection and your promise to be with us always bring us courage for the days ahead. And it's into your glorious name that we pray. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, and then he broke it. Then he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took a cup. He gave thanks, and he offered it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The ushers will direct you up to the table. We have gluten-free wafers in the bread tray. Grape juice is the yellow in the, in the wine tray. Nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. Well, I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone In your presence Lord Holy Spirit You are welcome here Come Flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, Lord, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare with your our living hope. 
your presence Well, I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere Your whole glory, Lord, is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, Lord, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord, your presence, oh God, how we love your presence, Lord.
I'd like the congregation to stand as we join our hearts together in prayer. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you've given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love, filled again by these signs of your grace. May we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace. For you are Lord forevermore. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Let's join in singing Resurrection Power. He is risen this morning. You called me from the grave by name. You called me out of all my shame. I see the old has passed away, the new has come. Now I have resurrection power, living on the inside, Jesus. You have given us freedom, oh, no longer bound by sin and darkness, living in the light of your goodness. You have given us freedom. I'm dressed up in your royalty. Your Holy Spirit lives in me. I see my past has been redeemed. The new has come. power living on the inside oh no longer bound by sin and darkness living in the light of your goodness you have given us freedom whoa now i have resurrection power living on the inside jesus you have given us freedom
what sacrifice could be equal to his own. The cross of Christ has declared that there is naught I owe. Yet I know I owe him all. The servant son, the prize.